And we are back. We are back with Kit O'Connell. Our monthly check-in with everything that, that Kit has going on. Um, <laughs> I'm your host, Jake Fox. We're broadcasting on 1040 AM, 92.1 FM, WYSL in Rochester, New York. Also on worldnewsradio.today. That's World News Radio. Not today, and we are here with Gonzo journalist Kit O'Connell of KitO'Connell.com. You know his work appears in a lot of places: uh, Mint Press News, Lee Camp. Um, shows a lot of um, shows a lot of Kit's work on his site. I think it's LeeCamp.net. Am I correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, and dot com. I think he just switched over. Okay, Lee, recently though. Yeah. Lee, Lee Camp. Camp. Dot com. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into a few of uh, Kit's stories here. Um, leading off, this one, you know, I've I've uh, I've I've always been, um, you know, every time a, a budget comes out, I, I guess I'm always sort of disappointed. But particularly, I'm always I'm always disappointed when you hear Republican budgets come out. You're like, what? What sort of precious thing are they going to destroy in in their budget? So, uh, Trump's budget sucker punches the poor and disabled. Democrats respond with a whimper, as they always do. I added the as they always do. Yeah, uh, <laughs> indeed. So, you know, why don't we, why don't we break down what important and. Um, just necessary programs that Trump's budget wants to slash and burn. Sure, I'll, I'll break down a few, although we could probably talk the whole hour just listing those off. <laughs> uh, you know, it continues what we've seen throughout the administration of both, you know, cutting, uh, just like directly cutting these vital programs, but also just sort of like undermining them in all kinds of ways, you know, reducing funding and and making sure that incompetent people are running them. It's all kind of part of the same, the same thing. But just to name a few, we're looking at food stamps, uh, Medicaid, uh, disability benefits for Social Security, uh, student loan availability, uh, and even like farm subsidies. Uh, but it's, it's pretty across the board as far as things that, that your listeners might care about. But, of course, children, disabled, and the poor are going to take it the worst. You know, all, all the classic bugaboos, children, you know, we got to get rid of them, right, Kit? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's the funny thing is that, you know, they want to force people to have more. They don't want them to be able to get abortions or even really access to, easy access to birth control. But of course, this is the classic Republican, you know, paradox. Once you have the kid, boy, they sure don't care. <laughs> you know, no, I don't. I actually under I understand what they're trying to do. I understand. I, I'm not saying I agree with it in any well, sort of way, but I understand where what they're going for. I, I just I don't know. It's um, I don't. I guess I also don't believe them. I don't believe that I I, I think it's it, it's um, it's something that they get caught up in, like a sort of I guess mass psychology thing within their culture, I, I guess you could call it. I, I, don't, I don't know, but I, I, I don't believe that a lot of these people, I don't think they're being, they're, they're being genuine when, when, when they say that they're, that they're so pro-life. I mean, they're so pro-life that they want, that, that they're pro-death penalty. You know? Right, yeah, oh yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's, a, it's an illusion for, for their other agendas, for sure. Well, there, in, a, in a lot of these people, like a lot of people, aren't religious in any sort of way, there, there isn't a religion, especially like northern, north, northern, northeastern, I guess, Republicans, um, they're not, they're not really religious, and, and if, and if they are, it's, it's, it's really not like a, like a public sort of chest-thumping sort of thing in the Northeast. And you know this being from, mm-hmm. being from the Northeast. But uh, so the, it's, uh, it's, it's confusing to me 
how uh, how th how that all works. But I, I, I guess I, I guess I'll uh, have to remain confused. So I think we all will. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, why don't we get to this? Is what I really wanted to get to. Hemp for victory. The government made this World War II cannabis film disappear. During World War mm -hmm. II, hemp was so desperately needed by the Allies that the United States briefly reversed its stance on hemp and encouraged farmers to grow it. Afterwards, they tried to erase all records of this campaign. I had no idea that this happened. You know, was this like a, a big, profitable cash crop for, for uh, people? Oh, I mean, of course, you know, for, for, for a long time, it was a profitable cash crop in the United States. It was you know, one of the more common crops that people were growing, and, and, I mean, famously, you know, at the very first days of America, you could exchange hemp crops for, for paying some of your taxes. Uh, you know, people say the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence is quote-unquote printed on hemp. Uh, actually, you know, when we look at the ones that are in the museums, the preserved ones, those are on, like, parchment, but the original drafts, when they were working on them, they were using hemp paper to draft those documents. Um, and, and so for, you know, of course, for, for, for the first many years, you know, the centuries of America, hemp was vital until we have after, you know, draw, alcohol prohibition ends and we sort of a lot of that apparatus rolls over into alcohol, or to drug prohibition, and of course they went after hemp is one of, and marijuana, cannabis is one of their first targets. Uh, but hemp was still a vital part of many industries, in particular like the naval, the shipping industry, they were still using hemp for ropes and for sails. And during World War II, and so we're talking about about 10, maybe 15 years at most, after they started this drug prohibition, you know, 15, 20 years, after the beginning of drug prohibition, uh, they suddenly realized, oh, no, we need hemp. We're running out. And, you know, the, the Japanese controlled a lot of the hemp supplies and the alternatives to hemp, a lot of those came through India, and that was also still, like, embargoed or difficult to get shipments from during World War II. And so suddenly the Allies needed hemp. And it, so the policy of making it illegal to grow was temporarily reversed. And not only was it reversed, but it was pitched as a patriotic thing to grow hemp. And this film, uh, it came out in 1942. It was a product of the USDA, so an official government film called Hemp for Victory. If you search for it on YouTube, you'll find it because it's in the public domain. Great, fascinating film, not just because of it, like of how it came about, this weird reversal, but in the film itself, which is about 15 minutes long, it's basically uh, a super simple, quick lesson on why hemp was important to humans for centuries before the drug war started and just how vital a crop it was in all kinds of industries. And, and so it's just extraordinary to me that this film was made at all, and that the government was, was promoting real hemp history for this very short window. Uh, and then, of course, the war ended, and they didn't need these patriotic hemp growers anymore, and we went right back into drug prohibition, of course, leading into, you know, Nixon kicking up in the high gear uh, later on. Uh, and this film, this was fascinating is after this film was, you know, useful, shall we say, to the, to the government, uh, it vanished. They even, you know, it was in a lot of college libraries in their film libraries, but the USDA sent letters around asking them to destroy it. Uh, and it didn't reemerge until um, basically in the, the 1991, if I recall correctly, these videos started popping up. Uh, people, 1989, excuse me, was one of the first videos. So, some, some hemp activists, including Jack Carrar, who people probably may have heard of, uh, who wrote the famous book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, uh, which is a great book about hemp and cannabis. He was sent a VHS copy of his Hemp for Victory, and a couple other hemp activists were also, you know, sort of circulating these copies. And it was clearly a government-made film, but when they wrote to the government, the government basically denied that it ever existed. They'd get these letters back saying, we can't find any record that we ever made this film. And uh, finally, uh, about a year after it was first discovered, a guy named John Bernbach finally got the National Archives to admit that the government had made this film. Why do you think they wanted to erase all evidence that this film was ever made? Um, why, why do you think they, they 
made it illegal right after the war? I mean, do you think there was like lobbying on behalf of logging companies, or, or what? What happened here? Do you think? Uh, I mean, that certainly was Jack Harrar's theory. If you look at the Emperor Wears No Clothes, that it was you know the logging industry, the paper industry, a lot of the industries that were endangered by um, uh, hemp, and, and you know even potentially the budding legal alcohol industry had have had a hand in it. Um, I think also, of course, we've just got, you know, there's just this massive government momentum to make things illegal. You know, they've created this whole apparatus during alcohol prohibition. Uh, and it's important to remember, like, in our great-great-great-grandparents' time, we're talking about, like, you know, the turn of the 20th century and end of the, ninth, of the 19th century, turn into the 20th century. Cannabis, if, if you know... If mom was having menstrual cramps, she'd send little Timmy down to the to the pharmacy at the corner, and they'd send her ho- him home with cannabis tincture for mom. This was a no big deal substance that was in every doctor's you know toolbox, um, and you know this immense apparatus that was created with alcohol prohibition. Of course, you know they had they didn't want to all be out of work. You know all the people c- uh, cracking down on alcohol uh, smuggling and, and and speakeasies. All of a sudden, this was all legal. So what were they going to do? Uh, they weren't just going to go home, unfortunately. They, they instead orchestrated this whole fear of drugs, and part of that involved demonizing this crop that had been part of uh, everyday life. Of course, marijuana is a Mexican slang term that was adopted pretty much deliberately to make this plant, cannabis, or hemp into a scary thing because of the rampant racism against Mex- Mexicans at the time. So, under this next hemp-related article, hemp makes great plastic. So why isn't hemp plastic everywhere? And is this, um, you know, much more degradable than made with uh, petrochemicals? It it certainly can be, yeah. Um, I think that there are companies experimenting with less and more degradable types of cannabis plastic. Uh, I mean, of course, biodegrading is a difficult topic. You know, it's it's not as simple as, as, you know, it would be in a science fiction film where we just toss it on the ground and it crumples into dust. Um, you know, biodegradable plastics, regardless of what they're made of, we still have to be very responsible about them because biodegrading is a process that can still take years. And there's some conditions, like packed in tiny plastic sacks in a landfill, where things just don't biodegrade very well at all. But that said, hemp plastic could be much more biodegradable than stuff made from petrochemicals, yes. And if it's treated responsibly, it could be part of a much better use of plastics um, in general. Uh, The technology, of course, the article that I wrote, uh, this and the last article I wrote both for uh, Ministry of Hemp, which is a great site people should check out. Uh, And, uh, yeah, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of potential here. Uh, It's very easy to make sort of uh, cellophane and flat type plastics uh, from, uh, hemp and other plant materials. Uh, they're still working on making like composite plastics, like what we talk about, like say a soda bottle or a, a bottle of laundry detergent or whatever, any kind of plastic bottle that we encounter. That technology is still unfortunately pretty challenging. Um, companies even like Pepsi and Coca-Cola have been experimenting with plant-based bottles. But if you go to the store right now and you get one of those plant bottles that they're advertising the soda companies, what you're actually buying is something that's only about 30% plant, and the other 70% is still fossil fuels. Um, and the technology is not there yet. Uh, part of it, of course, is we have these huge subsidies for fossil fuels that make it incredibly cheap, whereas hemp uh, is still only able to be grown in America under very limited conditions. So prices are high, research is down, and, of course, there's just a the whole stigma around it still that... You know, hemp is associated with the demon weed, uh, and, uh, you know, that that's a real problem. But there are, of course, a lot of companies looking into hemp plastics and other just alternative plants, but, you know, hemp does have a lot of advantages if we can, you know, fully legalize growing it and promote it and also scale back some of these fossil fuel subsidies that, that are pretty harmful in their own right. Um, it could We could see a real explosion of hemp growing uh, and hemp, uh, just in general, we actually just started, hemp just started growing in Pennsylvania for the first time in decades. So it is spreading, but the law is still keeping it much slower than it, it should be. 
Did you just say that it's it's hard to grow hemp in the United States? In in terms it's of hard. not not legally, I'm I'm talking about, but hard to like you know coffee only grows in certain places. Is is that the same with hemp? No, I I just meant I actually just meant legally. Uh, hemp is actually you know it depends on the variety you're growing. Um, there's dozens of different varieties of hemp, and some of them are really extremely well suited to the United States. Uh, one thing we're actually seeing is hemp growing is really booming in what used to be tobacco country. I've got an article coming out from Ministry of Hemp uh, probably later this week, so if you keep an eye on their blog, that'll be up soon. But I'm looking at it. It's really fascinating. You know, tobacco growing has fallen off thanks to changes in laws and just the increased stigma around smoking and awareness of the health effects. And so a lot of these growers that were growing tobacco are now turning to hemp. It grows really well in the conditions of the southeast U.S., actually, the the, the, te- the weather, the climate there is great. It's really great for drying it during the cool months and growing it during the hot months there. Uh, and uh, it's really revitalized some parts of the economy there, which is pretty fascinating. And what I find even more fascinating is that that has made hemp, uh, you know, cannabis in general, but especially hemp is becoming very much a bipartisan issue, uh, which, you know, is so rare these days to see any kind of agreement. But uh, actually earlier today, uh, uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand uh, tweeted about supporting research into hemp and cannabis, and in her tweet, she name-checked Rand Paul as one of her allies on that. So, you know, we're seeing even, you know, both sides of the aisle in Congress is increasing support for both hemp and cannabis. And a lot of it is, is you know, these conservative places, uh, you know, that used to be tobacco country, there's these, all these growers that were out of work, and now they're going to their legislators and saying, hey, please support this because this is revitalizing our lives. Now, what, what, uh, what other things can we make with hemp? I mean, it sounds like this almost miracle plant. It does. I mean, it is. You know, it's, it, it, it can be made into a lot of different objects. Um, of course, um, you know, some, some of that is, is you know, it, it's, some stuff, it's, it's very expensive to make into some products right now, but a lot of that is, again, just like availability of hemp supplies and legal restrictions. But we can make it into, you know, of course, uh, uh, paper, uh, you know, textiles and fabrics can be made from it. Uh, you know, uh, they're making backpacks out of it. There's a company making skateboards out of hemp right now. Uh, and, of course, uh, one of the really common popular products as far as, like, people's health is a lot of people are experimenting with uh, CBD oil, which is, like, a, an extract from hemp. It does not make people high, but it does offer some benefits for them in terms of, like, chronic pain and insomnia and sometimes epilepsy especially. Uh, and that's being made in the U.S. from these U.S. hemp supplies that we've been growing for the last few years legally. Kid O'Connell. Thank you very much for coming on the show today. Go to kitoconnell.com to check out all of Kit's work. Um, you can find his work not only on kitoconnell.com, but a lot of his work um, on mintpressnews.com, Ministry of Hemp, leecamp.com. Kit, I'd like to give you the floor if you've got any project or article you're currently working on or any message you want to give out to the audience. Go for it. Uh, you know, I'm, I want to bring up some activism I'm doing real quick, which is, uh, you know, here in Austin, we're working on some uh, activism to, to, to oppose uh, an extremely Islamophobic event that's coming up, and this is happening nationwide. There's an organization called Act for America, and they claim to be opposed to the spread of, quote-unquote, Sharia law in the U.S. But of course, that's really just a bugaboo that they've invented you know, the only laws that apply in the U.S. are U.S. laws. So this fear about Sharia is just a way to spread fear about Muslim people. Uh, and on Saturday, in many cities nationwide, there's going to be this march against Sharia, they're calling it. So I would just look in your local activist community and see if people are organizing against it. You know, it's really important that people in their communities come out and show that we support our Muslim neighbors. Um, and even if there's not a protest, you know, maybe just look for an opportunity to wish a Muslim neighbor a happy Ramadan. Uh, I think especially after the events we saw in Portland uh, and in other places we've been seeing these, these kinds of hate crimes, I think it's really important that we stand uh, together uh, as, a, as communities against these kinds of bigotry. 
Thank you very much, Kit, and uh, looking forward to your next report next month. All right, see you then. Bye. Bye. And that was Kit O'Connell. We are going to be right back with Turd Ferguson of TFMetalsReport.com with our Economics and Precious Metals Report. So stay tuned for that. We will be right back. <laughs> 